Uh, my name's Ed Simpson. I'm a nuclear physicist and Canvas leading semi-professional Harry Potter lookalike. Um, so, one of the things I'm interested in is actually nuclear astrophysics. Now, that's a bit of a contradiction for a, for a field. It's simultaneously about nuclei. Um, they're, they're all around us. Um, they're incomprehensibly small. Um, and stars, they're, they're all the way, you know, up there. And though they look really small, they're actually pretty big when you get up close. Um, and, and really, it's the story of how nuclear physics makes stars work, and the story of uh, how literally everything around you came to be made, um, which is kind of fun. Um, so it's really nice to be here at Physics and Park to talk a little bit about nuclear physics, but uh, I mean, if I'm honest, my, my favorite people to talk to um, in the whole world uh, about nuclear physics, um, and this is just because they tend to get really excited when you mention the word nuclear, um, are uh, customs and immigration officials. <laughs> So, <laughs> picture the scene, a um, 15 hour flight, cross-eyed through lack of sleep, two terrible movies and unspecified number of gin and tonics. Um, I, I drag my exhausted carcass up to the desk and hand over my form to the utterly disinterested looking customs and immigration official. Um, you, you see a tick the box that says I'm not a terrorist. <laughs> and the one that says I'm not, I'm not a communist. <laughs> and just for reference, I don't know where the Nazi gold is buried. Um, the objective is this, try and get to the baggage carousel without mentioning the word nuclear. Um, even if you whisper, they, they, they tend to get a bit excited and ask awkward follow-up questions, um, like one I received on a recent trip to Seattle. Um, are you carrying any radiological materials? <laughs> well, I'm a theorist. <laughs> So no, but um, I mean, it sort, of, it sort of felt like he'd be a bit, a bit disappointed. <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, the, the carbon in my body is approximately one part per trillion carbon fourteen. It's a radioactive isotope of carbon with eight neutrons rather than the garden variety six. Um, it's, it's produced in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays collide with nitrogen, and then it beats the case for half life of five thousand seven hundred years. Um, it accumulates into living stuff whether it's alive uh, or inanimate objects when they're made uh, and then gradually decays away. So we're measuring how much carbon-14 is actually you can uh, see how old something is. That's, that's carbon dating. <laughs> so he looked me sort of blankly. <laughs> As if to say, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Evidently, um, evidently not a fan of time team. Um, so uh, uh, I, I thought I'd try again. Um, I had a banana. For those in the front row who are wondering, it was, it was just a banana. <laughs> it's getting a bit soft, actually. Uh, <laughs> so, bananas, but bananas are famously a good source of potassium, approximately one part per 10,000, which is radioactive potassium 40. It's a beta emitter of a half life of 1.2 billion years. Um, in fact, bananas are so famously radioactive, they named a unit of radiation dose after them. Banana dose equivalent. <laughs> now, um, this somewhat whimsically expresses radiation dose uh, in terms of the equivalent number of bananas. So if you go for a chest x-ray, that's 200 bananas. <laughs> a trans-Pacific flight, that's 800 bananas. <laughs> now, I mean, of course, the human body itself contains some potassium, and also some carbon-14, so the human body is radioactive, um, which means that getting laid is a bargain at half a banana. <laughs> This also is not the sort of thing that customs and immigration are really interested in. <laughs> I mean, I offered him half the banana, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought I'd have one last try. Um, uh, so, cigarettes. Um, uh, cigarettes are known to contain trace amounts of polonium-210. Um, that's, that's an alpha emitter with a half-life of 140 days. Um, it's, uh, it's an artificial isotope. It needs to be produced, uh, for example, by bonding, bombarding bismuth 209 with neutrons at a nuclear reactor. Um, it was used uh, during the Cold War to keep Russian moon landers warm at night and was more recently used to assassinate former KGB agent and Russian distant Alexander Litvinenko. Which is not really the sort of thing you're supposed to say to customs in the Russian business. <laughs> um, I, I didn't say any of that. Shamefully, <laughs> shamefully, my response to the question, are you carrying any radiological materials, was, I'm just a theorist. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, if there's any lawyers in the audience watching, I don't know how much polonium-210 is in this particular brand of miniature death sticks. Um, I, I did ask. <laughs> um, but the girl in the shop didn't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so... Okay, so the 
conference I was going to the conference I was going to was all about deciding how fast particular nuclear reactions occur um, in stars and in the sun. And the thing that's most astonishing about the nuclear reactions that power stars is the difference in scale between the nuclear reactions themselves and, and the sun. So if I take a single teaspoon of water and add it to all the oceans in the world, the difference in mass is about 23 orders of magnitude. Um, that's a factor of 100 billion trillion. Um, you know, which is quite a lot. At the rate of one teaspoon per second, it would take around 600,000 times the age of the entire universe to fill the oceans. Um, which, you know, it's a long time. The trouble is you can't express a similar analogy in terms of teaspoons of water for nuclear reactions in stars. However many star, uh, how many teaspoons you have, the sun is really fucking big. <laughs> the protons that power the sun are 57 orders of magnitude smaller in mass. That's a factor of 1,000 million, million, billion, billion, trillion, trillion which, you know, is sort of getting into homeopathy territory. <laughs> so, uh, at this point in the proceedings, the uh, brief synopsis of nuclear synthesis throughout the entire history of the universe is appropriate. BANG! Um, but in terms of nuclear synthesis, the Big Bang doesn't actually mean very much. <laughs> Some, some hydrogen, some helium, and a little bit of lithium. Everything heavier than that gets made in stars, and it proceeds through a series of fusion reactions, which uh, kind of goes a bit like the Bible. <laughs> hydrogen begat deuterium, deuterium begat helium-3, helium-3 begat helium-4. <laughs> Somewhat controversially, helium-4 needs to then team up with two other helium-4s to begat carbon-12 in something with a cosmic menage a trois called the triple alpha process. <laughs> which, as far as I'm aware, wasn't the Bible. Um, but uh, this sequence of fusion reactions only gets you so far. You can only make up to mass iron by what we call main sequence burning in stars. Everything heavier than that gets made in cataclysmic astrophysical scenarios like neutron star collisions or supernovae. Um, and simply put, um, how stars work and how everything around you got made depends critically on nuclear physics. Um, and literally everything around you was once inside a star. Which kind of sounds like a good chat up line. <laughs> I, I can only apologise. Um, all the essence in your body, they come from the stars. Which, which is nice, it's beautiful, it's true. And um, some of them, some of them came from the Big Bang. <laughs> which, whilst it's also true, could be considered as a bit creepy. Some of them. Some of them probably came from the cataclysmic collision of two neutron stars, subsequently forming a black hole, assuming their total mass exceeds the total of one of volt per minute. Which doesn't really make sense as a chat up line, um, particularly not unless you've had eight minutes to explain nuclear astrophysics, usually by which point it's too late. <laughs> At that point, you may as well just offer them half a banana. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody.